Once you understand what is causing your flying phobia, you can do something about it. And I know exactly what is causing that fear, not just because I've successfully treated people for flying phobias, but because I used to be an aerophobe myself. Yes, the only way I could get on a plane in my 20s was if I was blind drunk. But before we get on to the root cause of your flying phobia, there are a few other things you need to understand in order to overcome aerophobia. Firstly, the best way to get rid of any phobia is to be gradually exposed to what you fear until you can tolerate it. But you can't be gradually exposed to flying. Sure, you can use a virtual reality app or do imaginary exposure, but you can't gradually increase your time on a plane by five minute increments. Most flights are a minimum of an hour. And if by the time you get on the plane, you are so worked up that the slightest noise or bump turns you into an hysterical screaming mess, then there's not much chance of desensitizing. So let's look at why you are in such a volatile state even before you get on the plane. Tell me in the comments below if you recognize any of the following behaviors and keep an eye on that mysterious gauge on the right hand side. A few weeks before the flight, you may start Googling how safe is flying. Maybe you'll try and find out what sort of plane you'll be on and what its safety record is. You might seek reassurance from friends or family. At the airport, you might take Valium or start drinking alcohol. At the departure lounge, you might start looking to see who looks like a hijacker or terrorist. At the departure gate, you now know exactly who is getting on your plane, and you may watch them very carefully for suspicious behaviours. As you approach the plane, you'll start inspecting it for rust, defects or leaks. On the plane, you may watch the flight attendant's face to see if they give away any signs that something is wrong. Then bang! Panic attack! You will notice that the gauge is now on red. That gauge is your danger gauge. You see, all these things that you've been doing to supposedly keep yourself safe have tricked your brain into thinking that you are in danger, so it's activated your fight or flight response. It will now speed up your heart rate and breathing, flood your body with adrenaline, and send wave after wave of catastrophic thoughts convincing you that the plane is either about to be hijacked, blown up, or crash. But stop. Look around, and you will notice that everyone else is relaxed. The reason is not because they're all too dumb to see the catastrophe that is clearly unfolding before your eyes, but because they have not been fueling their danger gauges with the same behaviours as you. You see, in psychology, these behaviours are known as safety behaviours, and a primitive part of the brain called the hippocampus learns about danger from these behaviours. The hippocampus primes a part of the brain called the amygdala to set off the fight or flight response if it senses danger. When you challenge the thoughts that drive the safety behaviours, they become easier to resist. So think about the logic of these safety behaviours and ask yourself these questions. Are you better qualified to spot aircraft defects than a team of engineers who service and check them? Are you more likely to spot a terrorist than airport security measures or the intelligence services? Is there any point looking at safety statistics when you've read many times that flying is the safest mode of transport? If you can resist using these safety behaviours, your danger gauge will register much lower when you get on the plane. You might still feel nervous, but you will not be so near the panic threshold, and after a few flights without safety behaviours, you'll be free of your flying phobia, just like me. If you have found this video useful, please click the like button. And for more information on phobias and anxiety disorders, please subscribe to my channel, where I have many more videos like this.